Hey everyone! Today I'd like to talk about some useful probes and gadgets from AliExpress. I've put together a top list of little-known inexpensive gadgets that every electronics hobbyist should have in their workshop. I won't be covering ready-made devices or the popular DIY testers. I'll just show you some simple boards that cost only a few dollars, often no more than five. Let's start with this thing. This is a pretty interesting and quite useful gadget that lets you quickly and easily check the operation of switching power supplies and, in general, inductors that are working in a circuit. You can make a simple probe of this type yourself using a choke and an LED. But the Chinese version is quite sensitive and doesn't cost much either. It has a lithium battery that will last for a very long time. There's a voltage sensor in the form of a tiny inductor. When you bring this sensor close to the windings of a working and loaded power supply, transformer, or choke, an EMF is induced in the sensor. Next, the signal goes to one of the comparator's inputs, where it is compared with the signal on the other input. Here, the comparator works like a voltage relay. If there is a valid signal, the comparator output is high, the LED lights up. In other words, it provides a clear switching of the LED. It's either on or off. This prevents false triggering of the LED and makes the design less sensitive to interference. To operate the tester, you need to press and hold the button. With this tester, you can quickly check the operation of switching power supplies, secondary power circuits on different boards, DC-DC converters, chargers, and so on. At the same time, the latter must definitely be operating, and there must be a load connected to their output. Of course, you can't perform a full diagnosis of a power supply with this kind of tester. But if, for example, the transformer is working, then the problem is in the secondary circuit of the power supply or not in it at all. Once again, this is not a measuring instrument, but simply a tester that will show which converter is working and which is not. More precise diagnostics should be done with an oscilloscope or a multimeter. There is a similar, but simpler and cheaper tester without a comparator and lithium battery. It runs off any 5-volt power source via Type-C. It works just as well, but I personally like the first option more. A capacitor discharger is a great thing if you often work with switching power supplies. This device is designed for quickly and safely discharging residual voltage from capacitors. The tool has two spring-loaded probes with serrated tips to ensure a reliable contact. For this gadget, the polarity of the power supply and the type of current, AC or DC, don't matter since there's a rectifier at the input. On board, there's a kilovolt rated field effect transistor, which is actually quite rare. It's stated that this device will operate safely in circuits up to 1000 volts, but I wouldn't recommend using it above 5 or 600 volts. Load resistors are connected to the drain circuit of the transistor. There's a small control circuit for the switch and a two color LED indicator. When the device's probes are connected to a capacitor, the switch will open and the capacitor will discharge through the load resistors. The red indicator will light up. The process doesn't take long. A capacitor with a capacity of about 470 microfarads discharges in a couple of seconds. When the voltage on the capacitor drops to around 40 volts or less, the green indicator lights up. This LED will turn off when the voltage on the capacitor is below 5 or 6 volts. In other words, the device discharges the capacitor to zero. How hot do the resistors and transistor get during operation? Well, let's find out. Let's take my new toy a cool thermal imager from Smart Sensor, the ST9550, kindly provided by the Super Ice Store, and discharge a 470 microfarad capacitor charged up to 310 volts. As we can see, the components didn't really heat up in such a short period of time. So everything's fine, as long as you're not discharging huge capacitors or poking the discharger into a source that's still powered. As for the thermal imager, people in various professions will appreciate it, especially repair technicians. This model has a lithium battery with a 5 amp hour capacity and a built-in camera. You can overlay the camera image onto the thermogram. It has built-in storage of 6.6 .6 gigabytes. You can take photos and transfer them to a computer. It features a good 3.5 inch display. The thermal imager is quite accurate. Up to 100 degrees Celsius, the margin of error is only 2 degrees. In the main range from 100 to 400 degrees, the margin of error is within 2 to 3 percent. The probes are adjustable. You can loosen them and set any angle you want. Thanks to the fact that they're spring-loaded, you can easily adjust the angle of attack. Regarding safety, the circuit is insulated with heat shrink tubing. In theory, that should be enough, but it's better to add another couple of layers of heat shrink or put the device in some kind of plastic case and make a window for the indicator or even choose a transparent case altogether. Basically, it's the equivalent of a 220-volt light bulb with two wires. But a light bulb is bulky and fragile. While this thing might cost a bit more than a bulb, but it's much more convenient. Although, who am I kidding? The light bulb is our everything. The board you see in front of you right now can be useful for checking the accuracy of budget multimeters. 
It has precision resistors on board with a tolerance of 0.1% and a TCR of 25 ppm. The resistors are different, 10 ohms, 100 ohms, 1 kiloom, 10 kiloohms, and 100 kiloohms. There are also capacitors, 100 picofarads, 1 nanofarad, 10 nanofarads, 100 nanofarads, 1 in 10 microfarads. Apparently, the Chinese measured all of this additionally, and next to each component, its actual value is written. I checked this board, and it turned out that the resistors really do fall completely within the 0.1% tolerance. The capacitors are good too. At least their capacitance matches what's written. The board costs about two and a half to three dollars, and it definitely won't be unnecessary, especially if you have doubts about the readings from your handy multimeters. What about voltage? The Chinese have some very popular modules based on the 8584 voltage reference. They can come in different versions, with a compartment for a 12 volt battery with push button voltage selection and so on. The chip outputs four levels right away: two and a half volts, five volts, seven and a half volts, and ten volts. The budget option, but still a pretty stable voltage reference. Its temperature coefficient is around 15 to 25 ppm per degree Celsius. The better the grade, the less it drifts. The most important thing is the accuracy class. The 8584 with the L index is the best one. At 10 volts, the deviation is just a few millivolts. But in many official data sheets from analog devices, reference chips with the L index aren't listed. The 8584K is the mid range option, with deviations up to plus or minus 10 millivolts. The 8584J is the most basic one, with deviations up to plus or minus 30 millivolts at 10 volts. On boards like these, you often see markings like JH. It's simple. J is the grade and H is the package type. So basically, it's the base version, but even that one will do just fine. A multimeter in the 10 volt range will show something like from 9.99 to 10.01 volts, and at 2.5 volts, from 2.49 to 2.50. That's more than enough for everyday testing. There are also yellow boards with the 8584LH. They really are better, but often they're just remark chips. The Chinese often write the voltage value right on the case after comparing it with the reference instrument. In that case, you can trust at least two or three decimal places. But if you need something more serious, just go for a board with the LEM399 reference source. Granted, they're three to five times more expensive, but the LEM399 is much more stable and has very low noise. It's used in precision voltmeters with six and a half digits. Calibrated versions can reliably provide five decimal places. For portable multimeters, that's overkill. Unless, of course, you're the lucky owner of the king of all portable multimeters with six and a half digits, the Metro at 30M from Germany's Goss and MetroWatt. By the way, if you happen to have one lying around and for some reason want to sell it, I'd be more than happy to buy it. The next simple tester lets you check standard optocouplers. There's a version of this board with a built-in battery and another with external power via a Type-C port, like mine. The board is equipped with four spring-loaded contacts. The anode is labeled. You can quickly connect to the optocoupler and test it. There's also an extra slot for testing surface mount optocouplers. And there's a dip socket as well. This board features an NE555 chip on board, which acts as a pulse generator. The first LED stays on constantly, and the second will blink if the optocoupler is working properly. The circuit tests the optocoupler quite thoroughly. Power is supplied to the optocoupler's LED which causes the built-in transistor to turn on. If the second LED starts blinking, it means the optocoupler is working properly. If the optocoupler's LED is faulty, the transistor won't turn on and the tester's LED won't light up at all. If the optocoupler's transistor is shorted, the tester's LED will stay on instead of blinking, which means the optocoupler is faulty. All in all, it's a well-thought-out circuit that will save you time. The next simple tester will help you determine a battery's capacity. More accurately, it should be called a capacity counter. It's called the ZB2L3 and is the cheapest meter of its kind. It comes with a pair of 5 watt, 7.5 ohm resistors. A few years ago, I did a detailed review of this board on my second channel. If you're interested, you'll find the link in the description. It's designed to determine a battery's capacity by discharging it. The battery voltage can range from 1 to 15 volts. The device itself is powered by 5 volts via micro USB. The maximum discharge current is up to 3 amps and depends on the resistors. The discharge cutoff voltage can be adjusted in 10 millivolt increments. Basically, you connect the battery and resistors to the device, set the discharge cutoff voltage, start it, and the battery will discharge down to the set voltage. There is a seven segment display that shows the discharge current, the voltage on the battery, and the capacity delivered at that moment. When the discharge is finished, the total delivered capacity is displayed on the screen. This is certainly convenient, but there are a few buts. The device is not a current stabilizer. 
The set current value will decrease as the battery discharges. In this video, I showed how to add a current stabilizer to this meter and create a full-fledged discharger. There is also no protection against battery reverse polarity, but on the plus side it has a bunch of features like current and voltage calibration. How to calibrate it was shown in this video. It's important to understand that the battery discharges into load resistors, so naturally, they'll get hot. If you want, you can replace the included resistors with others that are more powerful. Logic Pro. This thing can be useful for quickly diagnosing all sorts of boards for the presence or absence of necessary signals. The probe has power leads and a measuring tip. It is powered by the same source as the board being diagnosed. If there is a high level on the probe, the red LED will light up. If there is a low level, the green one will light up. If there is high resistance or an open circuit, or if the voltage is insufficient to trigger a high level, the blue indicator will light up. This indicator also serves to some extent as a power presence indicator. When powered by 5 volts, the tester will show a low level if the voltage on the probe is less than 0.6 volts. If it is up to 2.4 volts, it will indicate high resistance, and if it is above 2.4 volts, that is considered a high level. In the case of a 3.3 volt power supply, from 0 to 0 0.39 volts is a low level, up to 1.49 volts is high resistance. Anything above that is a high level. If both indicators are lit, it means the signal is pulsed with a fairly high frequency, and our eyes can't catch the switching. But if the signal is low frequency, everything becomes much clearer. On that note, the video comes to an end. That's all I wanted to show you today, and I hope you found it interesting. Let me remind you that all the necessary links are, as always, in the description, including links to my two other channels. I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. Well, that's all from me. As always, this was Kazinov Ka with you, and until next time, bye.